With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. Yusef Gujar was set free by a Pakistani court. It was irrefutably proven that he had murdered a man and his wife, young parents of four children that had been born, and the woman was pregnant with child number five. Gujar had taken this man and woman and thrown them into a brick kiln and burned them alive. His part in their murder was without question, but he was set free by the Pakistani court because he was able to prove that he murdered them because they had converted from Islam to Christianity and had burned several pages of the Koran. His act was then deemed to be justifiable homicide. On Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday 2016, as we gathered here to worship the risen Christ, 74 of our Pakistani brothers and sisters in Christ were killed when a bomb detonated at their worship service. 300 others were injured in that, and the the Taliban in Pakistan immediately claimed responsibility for that bomb, and they were unequivocally clear. They detonated that bomb. They killed those Christians because they had dared to gather to worship a resurrected Messiah named Jesus. Admittedly, on a lower scale, Kurt Schilling is probably one of the greatest pitchers to ever play the game of baseball. Uh, Some of you are old enough to remember his bloody sock victory in, in the World Series will go down as one of the greatest, most iconic moments in the history of Major League Baseball. And following his retirement, he became a commentator for ESPN Baseball, but he was fired from that commentator's chair. What led to his ousting from ESPN. Had he forgotten that three strikes and you're out? Had he forgotten that four bad pitches, we call them balls, four balls, and you're awarded a trip to first base? Had he forgotten that in Major League Baseball, you have nine innings of play? No. He had committed the egregious transgression of posting on his Facebook page that he thought that men ought to go to the bathroom in the men's room and ladies ought to go to the bathroom in the ladies' room. And for that, Kurt Schilling, the great major league pitcher, was out. How is that a blessing? When your students graduate from high school and go sit in a university classroom and their homosexual professor assigns them a research paper to write about how the LGBTQIA plus community in America is persecuted by white evangelical Christianity, and your student has to go back to their dorm, back to their apartment, sit down at the desk with their laptop, and they begin writing that pressure, not just with the academic pressure of making sure they meet all of the formatting requirements and Turabian formatting for their bibliography. They've got the additional pressure of either violating their conscience or pleasing their professor. My question for us today, how is that persecution a blessing from God? And to begin answering this question, we need to start with a definition. I'm going to give you a biblical definition of this word persecute in just a moment, but I want to start with just a common garden variety, even secular definition of the word persecute. And for that, we'll turn to the well-worn Webster's Dictionary that says that persecution is hostility and ill treatment, especially because of race or political or religious beliefs. In other words, Webster would say that you are persecuted when because of your religious beliefs, you suffer hostility and you receive ill treatment. And once again, I pose the simple question today, how is that a blessing? Just this past Thursday, a persecuted Christian brother from an African nation published an article, an op-ed really, in Christian Post, which is one of the most widely read online Christian news services. His article was titled, Trusting God Amid Suffering and Persecution. And I want you to notice the words that he wrote. He writes, it is indeed difficult to trust and believe God in times of persecution. Many whose hearts are not strongly rooted in Christ fall away when they cannot see the saving hands of God. How do you persuade a woman whose husband and only son were brutally murdered to continue to trust God for deliverance? 
How do you convince survivors of a Christian community whose inhabitants are attacked, killed, wounded, and displaced that all things work together for the good to those who love God? However, understanding God's Word will help us to stand firm and trust Him even in the most terrible situations. And church, I gave you this quote today for the sake of this last sentence. He writes, and I agree, Christians trust deficit. That is, the lack of trust, the lack of confidence, the lack of hope, the lack of faith. Christians' trust deficit can be attributed to a lack of knowledge of the ways of God. What he means, and once again, I agree, that when we suffer hardship, rebuke, and persecution, when we do not trust God in that moment, it's because we do not really know the Word of God, and more importantly, we do not rightly identify the God of that Word. How is persecution a blessing? Tonight, we will examine the outcome of persecution and consider what it produces in our lives. Tonight, we'll also investigate the operation of persecution. We're going to talk about the different ways in which we are persecuted. But this morning, I want us to just briefly discuss the occasion of persecution. Uh, Tonight, we'll look at what it produces and how it comes. Today, we're going to look at what causes it. What what brings about the occasion of persecution? In Matthew 5, 11, Jesus said, Blessed are you when others revile you. That word translated as when, we would probably understand it as whenever. Whatever it is that happens in your life that brings about reviling and persecution, Jesus said it is a blessing. So we should ask, when is it that persecution occurs? I need to go on record that every time you face hardship, it's not necessarily persecution. In fact, in my opinion and estimation, most of what we experience in the American church is not persecution at all. It is at most an inconvenience. And oftentimes, it's just a consequence of our own sin. For example, sir, if your wife is upset with you, there's trouble and suffering in your marriage because you've been addicted to pornography, that's not persecution. That's called being married to a godly woman. Teenager, if you've gotten in trouble because you disrespect your parents, that is not persecution for righteousness' sake. That's called good Christian parenting. But what is it that brings about persecution? Three things will comprise this morning's message. First, persecution comes when we exhibit sanctification. Back in verse 10, and I just want to walk us today through these three verses, Jesus said... Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. In the end of verse 11, he says, When they say these things against you falsely on my account or because of me. Jesus teaches that when we live and exhibit a sanctified life, when we walk in holiness and righteousness, persecution is going to come. Now, I'm personally convinced that persecution is on the increase in this country, but it is not because the church is getting more holy. It's because the world is getting more hostile. And when you live for Christ, your very conduct will be a source of anger and accusation from the world. Now, if you don't know it, the world in which we live, I'm even talking about the American religious system, they do not mind religion. They don't even, are not even bothered by talk of Christianity as long as it's a watered-down, mealy-mouthed, weak-kneed version of Christianity that won't say anything about the way that they're living that's outside the boundaries of God's Word. As long as Christianity is brought down to the level of all the other religions of the world, the world will not care. But when you start saying something about the authority of the Word of God... When you start mentioning that there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. When you start praising the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you start saying there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain, and the only way to gain heaven is by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, this world will turn on you like a rabid dog. Just getting up and going to church doesn't bother your neighbors. But when you start proclaiming only one, 
has crushed the curse of sin. Only one was raised to life again. Only one is king of every king, and only one is coming back for me. The world will begin to persecute you. Now, the sad reality is the fact that most American Christians cannot relate to even the mildest form of persecution is an indictment against us. Because the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.12 that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. In our student camp, this was a repeated verse that we shared in just about every single session. In the preaching time as well as in the small group time, we looked at 2 Timothy 3.12, emphasizing the words all and will. Not some who desire to live godly, but all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. Not might suffer, not can suffer, not has a high likelihood or probability of suffering, but all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And that presents this simple question. What does it say about my walk with Jesus Christ if I'm not suffering some form of persecution? According to the Bible, it tells us that you have no desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. Because the Bible says if you do have that desire, it will produce persecution from the world. John MacArthur comments here and writes that if we never experience ridicule, criticism, or rejection because of our faith, we have reason to examine the genuineness of it. That is the genuineness of our faith. Jesus said in verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, I need to make a very important distinction here this morning. Notice this statement. Persecution is when you face difficulty for doing right. Punishment is when you face difficulty for doing wrong. I want to emphasize this throughout the morning and the evening lesson. Every hardship in your life is not persecution. Sometimes it's just simple consequences for your sin. The book of 1 Peter is written to Christians in the first century to tell them how to endure suffering and persecution. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in the 15th verse, Simon Peter writes, Make sure none of you suffers as a murderer, a thief, evildoer, or troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers, it's the same word, if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. So you can suffer because of doing wrong, or you can suffer because of doing right. When you suffer having done wrong, that's called punishment. For the child of God, it may be called discipline or chastisement or correction. But when you've done wrong, that's punishment. When you suffer for doing right, that's rightly deemed persecution. Now, in our text today, the word persecute appears three different times, and it's the same Greek word. And it literally means to make to run, to harass or trouble, to pursue in a hostile manner. This word would be used from the world of hunting. Now, I like to deer hunt, but I don't usually dog hunt. For those of you that hunt with dogs, you'll understand this word. When the dogs get on a covey of quail, when the dogs tree a coon, when the dogs, Brother Lynn, get on the scent of a Boone and Crockett buck, those dogs begin to chase. They begin to follow. They begin to pursue. But not for the purpose of doing good. If they can get a hold of that animal, they will do it great harm. And that's the word the Spirit of God baptizes and places here in the Sermon on the Mount. So get ready for this. Here's what it means to be persecuted. It means the world is watching you, stalking you, observing you, hunting you down and harassing you, troubling you, pursuing you in a hostile manner in the same way that a hunter has his eye on some wild game. Now, I've already started clearing up a few things around where I want to deer hunt later this fall. And I've got some cameras out. 
And when I get in that deer stand and I see that buck coming off at maybe 400 yards approaching me, I have my eye on him. And you know what I'm hoping he does? I'm hoping he does something from his perspective that is dumb. I want him to do something that will cost him his life. And this word means that's how the world is watching you. Not watching to see if you'll do right. Watching in hopes you'll do something wrong. Sir, when you're at work and you slam your finger in the door or hit your thumb with the hammer or drop some heavy object on your toe and you don't have on steel-toed shoes, the world is watching and listening. And, and do you know what they're hoping you say? Well, I can't repeat today what they're hoping you say. They're hoping you let out a string of words that would make a drunken sailor blush. Why? Because that will validate their own life. I mean, if you as a professed Christian, a church-going man, a God-claiming woman, if you'll talk like that, that justifies in their mind them using those words. And in their fallen, depraved mind, that, those words even justify every other sin that they desire to commit. How can you talk to me about Jesus talking the way that you talk, saying what you just said, doing what you just did. You've no business to talk to me about the sexual immorality that consumes my life. The world is watching you, hoping you'll do something wrong so they can pounce on you. In fact, you'll note this statement on the screen. When you stumble, the world will be glad. And when you stand, the world will be mad. Why is the world angered by the righteous living of God's people? It's a source of conviction. It's a source of indictment. Philippians 2.15 says, Prove yourself to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. When Jesus came, he said of himself that he was the light of the world. But he also said that we were to be lights of the world too. Reflecting the light of the glory of Jesus Christ into a dark world. And have you ever noticed that when people want to walk in the darkness, there's one thing they don't want. They don't want any light. Men love the darkness more than the light because their deeds are evil. And I don't care if you're working at the timber company, at CSX, if you're working at the lumber yard, if you're a teacher in the school system, a stay-at-home mom, a plumber, a doctor, a lawyer, a ditch digger. There are people on the job, in the community, on the team with you who want to walk in darkness. And when you exhibit sanctification, it shines the light and says there is a difference in the way that you and I are living. Proverbs 29, 27 puts it this way. An unjust man is abominable to the righteous. And he who is upright in the way is abominable to the wicked. We should live a different life that distinguishes us from the lost world. And when we exhibit that sanctified life, what Jesus calls righteousness sake, persecution will come. Hebrews eleven thirteen 13 tells us that as Christians, we are to walk as strangers and foreigners on the earth. That is, we're not supposed to fit in. 1 Peter 2, 9, again, written to tell Christians how to endure suffering, says you need to start by recognizing God has called you to be a peculiar people. Some of you being peculiar is the only commandment of God you'll keep this week. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And yet, if we're honest, one of the last things we want to do is stand out from the world. One of the last things even the people of God want to do is be different from the world. Let's be honest, parents. The peer pressure to, to, to be accepted, that didn't stop when you graduated from high school. 
Students, listen to the pastor this morning. If you're thinking, if I can just graduate from high school and get out from under all of this peer pressure, get out of high school, and then I won't care what other people think about me anymore, that day will never, ever come. And whether we desire it for our own lives or for the lives of our children, if we're honest, the last thing we want to do is be odd man out. The last thing we want to do is be the only person in our group that hasn't seen that movie. The only person in our group that doesn't listen to that song or that kind of music. Students, you you don't want to be the only one in your class that doesn't have that form of technology. Why, if everybody else is wearing that, we want to know, Mom, Dad, why can't I wear it? And most kids don't ever even have a chance to ask that question because most parents will just buy them whatever everybody else has. The reality is most of America's Christians don't live differently enough from the world to warrant a raised eyebrow, a clucked tongue, or a harsh word, much less the sharp edge of an executioner's blade or the fiery trial that boiled the blood of the martyrs. Now, I thank God we have a lot of faithful people in this church, but, but let's just be honest for a moment. There are not many Christian women who face ridicule because they dress so modestly in a half-naked world. The fact that there is not an industry in Blackshear, Georgia to provide modest clothing for women is an indictment in and of itself. There are not many Christian teenagers who are ostracized by their peers because they only have a flip phone. To avoid temptation and sin. I recently celebrated my 19th anniversary as your pastor, and I've never gotten one call from the recreation department asking when we were going to be scheduling spring or fall revival, because if the t-ball tournament conflicts with spring revival, Emmanuel's folks won't go to the ball field. I've never gotten a call from the football team asking when fall revival was going to be so they could plan their practices around the things of God. And you know why we've never gotten those phone calls? They don't have to make them. Because God's people tend to act and live and respond just like the rest of the world. But when you exhibit sanctification, you will face persecution. In the late 1880s, Charles Penrose wrote a political article. America was still just kind of coming out culturally of of the Civil War. Penrose wrote an article in which he decried what he called hyphenated Americans. He warned about the dangers of foreigners and immigrants who want to immigrate to America but not assimilate into America. That is, people from other countries that want to come to the United States but don't really want to become Americans. They would stay in what Penrose called their little hyphenated enclaves. What is a hyphen? That's the dash that separates two words. What is a hyphenated American? Well, it's an Italian American, a German American, an Asian American. And while these may be legitimate ethnic monikers, Penrose warned about the fact that when you come to this country, we're going to have dangers if you don't assimilate and express a willingness to become just like everyone else. During World War I, the problem was so prevalent that President Woodrow Wilson said the American who carries around a hyphen for his ethnicity carries around a dagger that may be thrust into the internal organs of the republic at any moment. Teddy Roosevelt would later say that there's no such thing as a hyphenated American who is a good American. He wrote that the only man who is a good American is the man who is an American and nothing else. Now, if we're talking about public policy, American citizenship, the ability to to come and blend in and be a part of the larger culture, that may be excellent civics, but it is awful theology and it is unbiblical Christianity that because we live in this world, we should just assimilate and be just like everyone else. 
The Bible tells us that we are to be in this world, but not of the world. And when we keep that commandment and exhibit sanctification, persecution will come. There's a second occasion for persecution. Not only when we exhibit sanctification, but when we explain Scripture. When the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ came and began to speak out the light of the Word, that's when persecution really began to come against the Lord. Because as I've already mentioned, men love darkness more than light because their deeds are evil. Most police officers and security experts will tell you that one of the greatest deterrents to crime is light. Put some floodlights on your house. Trim those shrubs so light can shine in the dark places. The crime rate would go down immensely if we could keep the sun from setting. Because men still love to do their evil deeds in the darkness. And Jesus Christ came proclaiming and shining the light of the Word of God. And in John chapter 15 verse 22, Jesus said, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Now, Christ was not saying that if he had not come into the world, mankind would have never had any sin. That's not what that phrase means. He came into the world because he came to save sinners, for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What he means is that their sin would not have been exposed if their lifestyle had not been laid up beside the unchanging, unchangeable standard of the Word of God. And when Jesus began to speak the truth of the Word of God, that's when persecution came against our lovely Savior. As I told our students at camp a couple of weeks ago, the world still loves baby Jesus in the manger. The world will even celebrate baby Jesus in the manger. The world has its own holiday to honor baby Jesus in the manger. Why does the world love baby Jesus in the manger? It's because at that point in his earthly ministry, he'd not started talking yet. But once he began to speak, persecution came. And I want you to think about this. It makes no sense that a world system that would so despise the words of Jesus to the point that they would ridicule him, mock him, slander him, speak lies against him, to the point they would beat him within an inch of his life, nail him to a Roman cross, and crucify him. It makes no sense that that same world is going to throw us a ticker tape parade if we believe what he taught and repeat what he said. When you and I begin to explain the Scripture persecution will come. Acts chapter 4 verse 18 describes one of the encounters that the early apostles had with the religious council. And there the Bible says they called them and commanded them not to speak and not to teach in the name of Jesus. In other words, believe what you want to believe. Think what you want to think. But keep your opinion and especially keep your words to yourself. And that same thing is true today. When Jim Baker was Secretary of State, I'm not talking about the televangelist Jim Baker, but the politician, the statesman Jim Baker, when he was Secretary of State during the Ronald Reagan administration, it was said that he would bring newly appointed ambassadors into his office. And he had a large spinning globe there. You've seen these in classrooms. And the Secretary of State would spin that globe around and he would ask these new ambassadors if they, could, if they could locate the country they had just been appointed to represent. And many of them in an unsuspecting way would begin to search all over that globe for these little out-of-the-way countries that most people have never even heard of. At which point Jim Baker would turn that globe around and place his finger squarely on the United States of America. And he'd say, this is the country you've just been appointed to represent. Yeah. And brothers and sisters, I don't care where you're called to serve. In the workplace, in the community, on the ball team, in the club. This is the kingdom we've been called to represent. Yeah. 
And when you represent that kingdom, you will find that you are treated like a stranger, a pilgrim, a foreigner, an alien in a foreign world. We represent Jesus Christ. And we don't get to change his message. And therefore, those who rejected him because of his message will reject us because of our message too. Several years ago, in fact, I had only been the pastor here for a few years, and I preached a doctrinal message one Sunday morning. And a member came up disagreeing with that message. And here's what they said. They said, I'm going to call Brother Don. They were referencing Dr. Don Hathaway, my predecessor as pastor. And they were going to call my predecessor to ask him if my doctrinal point had been correct. And I said, go ahead and call him. But where do you think I learned that doctrine from? <laughs> In that particular case, if you, won't, if you don't like what I said, you won't like what he's going to say because all I did was repeat what he had said. And if you do that on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ, the world that hated his words will hate yours too. You say, preacher, what does that sound like? Well, it sounds like some student graduating from high school, going off to the university, sitting in a classroom where they're talking about women's reproductive rights, and they dare open up the Word of God, maybe just because they've hidden it in their heart and they've got it nestled in their mind, and they begin to say, I am a Christian, and I believe that all life is created in the image of God. I believe that we should praise Him because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I believe that God is the creator of life and that no person has the right to take unborn human life. I promise you, even on some so-called Christian university campuses, you will find yourself the subject of persecution. When you begin to say that God made them male and female in the beginning and he's still making them the same way today, and that you don't get to decide and you don't get to change, in this culture you will find yourself the object of persecution. So if you sit here and you think, well, I don't want to be persecuted, well, guess what? I'm not trying to sign up for any myself. But if you don't want to be persecuted, let me tell you how you can avoid persecution. Keep your head down, keep your Bible shut, and keep your mouth shut as tight as your Bible is shut. Keep your convictions to yourself, which, listen to me, means they were never convictions to start with if you can keep them to yourself and keep silent about them. But keep your mouth shut, your Bible shut, and your convictions to yourself, and you won't have any danger of facing persecution. But when you begin to speak up the truth of the Word of God, persecution will come. And according to Jesus, it will come as a blessing. Persecution comes, first of all, when we exhibit sanctification. It comes when we explain Scripture. Thirdly and finally for this morning, it comes when we exalt the Savior. Once again, our text says in verse 11, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and other utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. One translation says, for my sake. When you're doing it because you say, I'm a follower of the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to turn with me this morning a few books over to the right to the book of Acts. I could put this text on the screen, but I want you to get used to finding passages of Scripture in your Bible. So I want you to find the book of Acts, chapter 5, the last three verses of the chapter, Acts 5, beginning in verse 40. This is really the concluding account of the apostles being brought in before the Sanhedrin. This occasion started back in chapter 3 when Peter and John healed the lame man by the beautiful gate. A crowd came together. They preached the gospel. Many people got saved, and it started an ongoing battle between the apostles and the religious council. And the Bible tells us how this story ended in Acts 5, beginning in verse 40. And when they, the council, had called in the apostles, they beat them. And by the way, that's not describing a simple slap on the cheek. They beat them severely. We would say within an inch of their life, 
They beat them and charged them not to speak, and here's the problem, in the name of Jesus. And they let them go. Well, what did these men do? They left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor, here it is again, for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. Now, you may have noticed in our culture in recent years, there's a prominent bumper sticker. It's also on car tags, coffee mugs, T-shirts. It, it's the symbol of coexisting. And the word coexist is comprised in this case from the iconic symbols of the great religions of the world. Islam, the peace movement, the E is basically the religion of science, the star of David. You have symbols for uh, Eastern religions. And then the T on the end of the word coexist is supposedly derived from the image of the cross. By the way, the world is willing to coexist with the cross so long as you shrink down the size of the cross to make it on equal footing, like co-equal branches of government, co-equal branches of religion. As long as you teach, preach, and believe that the, that the message of the cross is just one equally sized spoke on this great wheel of spokes with all these different religions all equally leading to God, the world will not even balk at that brand of Christianity. But when you start saying there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, you're going to face persecution. When you begin saying that Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me, you're going to suffer persecution. In fact, earlier in this encounter with the Sanhedrin, the apostle said, we're, you decide for yourself whether it's right that we obey you, but we're going to obey God and not man. And here's why. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And they suffered persecution because they exalted the Lord Jesus Christ. In more recent years, this coexist symbol has even been co-opted by the homosexual movement. And the coexist symbol has been overlaid with the iconic rainbow symbol of homosexuality. And I will just say once again, as long as that T on the end, that rainbow coexisting T, as long as that's the cross that you embrace, the cross that you speak about, you don't have any danger of persecution. But when you say the cross is not like anything else, because the Lord Jesus is not like anybody else, that he and he alone as God come in the flesh, he and he alone died on a cross for your sin, he and he alone is the only way that you can be saved, the world will begin to persecute you. And preacher, I understand that, but you still haven't answered the question, how is persecution a blessing? Well, we'll develop that and answer it more fully in the evening service. But I close with an illustration I shared with our students. And I want you to sit very, very still and listen attentively. The story is told of a violinist who went to give a major recital. The concert hall was, was filled to capacity. And on the final note of the final song, the, the crowd leapt to their feet and they erupted with thunderous applause. It was a, a standing ovation. Backstage, standing in the wings, one of the stagehands said to the violinist, they're calling for an encore. Go back out. They're all standing. They want one more song. And the violinist said, I can't go back out there. I can't face that crowd. Why not? They're all standing to their feet. And the violinist said, they're not all standing. The man down in the middle of the front row, he's not standing. The stage hand said, that's just one man out of thousands that are cheering you on. And the violinist said, that man is my instructor. That's the man who knows more about what I should have done and could have done than the rest of the room combined. You know, that violinist was on to something really doesn't matter as a Christian if the rest of the world is standing and applauding if Jesus is not pleased. But here's the blessing. 
If you stand for what is right, even when the rest of the world will throw rotten tomatoes at you, if Jesus is pleased, that's the blessing. Again, the book of 1 Peter is written to talk to Christians about how to endure persecution, and I close with this verse this morning. Simon writes in chapter 2 and verse 20, For what credit is there if when you sin you are harshly treated, you endure with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, now here's the blessing, this finds favor with God. And my prayer for you as your pastor and as a fellow believer is that when we do what is right and we suffer patiently with endurance, that we'll experience the blessing of having favor with God. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website, at ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emmanuel Pulpit.